Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. I hope the content encourages you and helps you build your faith. Now enjoy the message. Hey, uh, I'm so glad to be with you here this morning. Uh, Luke texted me on Wednesday night and said, hey man, I'm in a bind. Uh, I gotta be out on Sunday, can you be there? And I said, sure. And uh, right after that, I, I walked into the break room at uh, the offices and I sat down to have dinner before church service on Wednesday night. And as I sat down, uh, I started a conversation with this seven-year-old boy who was sitting right next to me. You know, there's something about a seven-year-old. Like, they don't really have to have New Year's resolutions, right? You know, it's like, you're seven, you're skinny already, okay? Like, and so, you know, you could see the kid's ribs. I mean, he's skinny, scrawny little, little thing. And he starts talking to me about having abs. And uh, he starts, starts this conversation. He goes, what are abs? Because I don't really think I have any. And I said, oh, no, buddy, you got, you got some abs. And I started getting a little sucker punches in the stomach. And he's like, yeah, I got, I got abs. He goes, what about you? Do you have any abs? And I said, um, nope, but I have an ab. And uh, he looked at me. And you know those times people just looking you up and down? You're like, it's kind of rude to do. But like, he just starts looking me up and down. And he goes, whoa. You really do have an ab, and it's really, really big. He was talking about my gut. I just, uh, I, I was sitting there, and I was thinking about Luke's text, and I was thinking about how the fact that this seven-year-old just handed it to me. And, and I made the decision that, you know, sometimes things are just better when it gets handed to you, right? You know, just tell it like it is. That's what I love about kids. They just have this ability to just tell you like it is. You hear it, and, and you walk away, and you do something about it, or you don't. Now, I got to thinking, I was like, you know, uh, I shared a passage that I wanted to share with you all. My wife was like, you can't share that. And I was like, why? It's in the Bible. And she, she goes, because that, that's pretty intense. I'm like, well, yeah, but I've been there like four or five times, and we're kind of like cousins now or something. So I'm just going to tell you like it is today. Are you good with that? There is a verse in chapter 11 of the book of Luke where Jesus is talking. Now, now if Luke is watching this online, don't worry, buddy. Like, it's, it's all good. Like, I'm not getting crazy here. But it's talking about Jesus casting out demons. And in Luke chapter 11, Jesus says, if an unclean spirit leaves a man, the problem is this, that when the demon goes away, the man puts his house in order, his life in order, and the problem is that that demon will bring seven of his friends who are worse than him and then come back and return to the man. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 11 that it is worse for a man, that his later condition becomes worse than he even was to begin with. As I was reading that passage, I just got to thinking about how much more true is that in our lives today. You see, I love the series that Luke has started last week, Stop Something. Last week he talked about stopping something in our lives. But if we don't learn how to start something after we've stopped something, the problem is this. Our later condition can become worse than it even was to begin with. And so this morning I'm going to talk to you today about the idea of starting some things in your life. Now, we're Americans, and it's 2021, and everybody has their resolutions. Everybody is excited. The gyms were full this week. Why? Because everybody has in their mind to start something. But oftentimes what we find is it more, it's not as difficult as it is to start something as it is to keep doing something. So I'm going to share a passage today uh, out of the book of Kings. And I'm going to talk about a man named Elijah. But before we do, I, I just kind of want to reiterate this principle. We don't have the luxury of just stopping things in our life. We have to start something. So a few years ago, uh, when I, or a year ago when I turned 30, I started realizing something, that my metabolism was no longer working the way it had used to. Now, some of y'all are like 50, and you're like, yeah, I don't know why. What happened? Like, No, it was like 20 years ago for you. But th this begins to change and begins to take place, and we realize our metabolism isn't working the way we thought. So I made a decision. I'm going to stop eating Reese's. All right, no more Reese's. They are my addiction. Man, Reese's, don't send some in the mail to me tomorrow because I don't eat them anymore. Slash, I eat them all the time because I didn't stop all the way. But here's, here's what begins to happen. I realized something. I stopped eating Reese's for a while, but you know what happened? Bluebell came out with this ice cream called Blackberry Cobbler. Have you ever had it? Oh, if you have not had it, you have to go find it, and it only comes in seasons, so you, you bet you'll, you're lucky if you find it. They actually put pie crust in the ice cream. It's the best thing ever. But what I learned was the lesson that it's not just about stop eating Reese's, because I quickly found something else to put in its place. And so every night, right before you know, I went to bed, I would sit down, and I would have a bowl of Bluebell ice cream. 
right? And my later condition was worse than the way that I started. It's that way in our finances too. How many of y'all sit down around the beginning of the year? You sit down and you look at your budget. You begin to work and look at the next year so that you can sit down with your wife and tell her just how much money Starbucks is stealing from your account. Or to sit down with her and show her how the sales at Nordstrom don't actually save you money. And so we sit down at the beginning of the year and we begin to look and we pick out all the things that we're going to stop spending our money on in the year, right? But that doesn't actually solve all the problems that you might be facing financially. You see, we can't just stop spending money the way we don't want to. We have to make decisions about how we're going to invest, how we're going to sp- save, how we're going to give, what kind of priorities are going to take place in our finances. You see, we can't just stop. We have to start. It works the same way with addictions. You know, when, when people meet with uh, you know, pastors or counselors and they sit down in the office and someone is going through a very intense addiction, You know that they don't just sit across the table, a good counselor, a good pastor won't just sit across the table and say, stop doing that. It's kind of like the guy, you know, when you go, uh, there was somebody I knew, he went uh, play golf with a famous golfer, professional golfer. And uh, he stood up next to a hole, and on the left there was water trap, and on the right was the fairway. And and, and the professional golfer looked at him and said, where are you going to hit the ball? He said, well, I'm not going to hit it over there in the water. You know what he did? He hid in the water. Why? Because oftentimes what we tell ourselves is don't do something. And the more we tell ourselves don't do something, inevitably we end up doing it. And and so when it comes to addiction, when we sit down with people and we counsel and we work on some things in our own lives that we want to get free from or see come out differently, what has to take place is a conversation around what you want to start doing, what you want to put into place in your life. Back in April or May, uh, Art Conroe was shut down for a season. We had to uh, go online only, uh, like you all did for a season. And, and as we're online, um, one Wednesday night, I'm walking down to the auditorium uh, where we're getting ready to record our service. As I'm walking through the halls, I'm met by a teenager, much to my surprise, because every door in the church building is supposed to be locked. No teenagers are in the building. I'm, I'm walking down the hallway, and this teenager walks up, and I'm like, what are you doing here? And I don't know how he got in. He had snuck in some side door. He had found his way in. And, and I said, hey, man, I, I'm so sorry, I, I, you know, but church is closed. And as I begin to share that with him, he, he looks at me, and he has just that look of sheer panic in his face. Now, I work with teenagers, right? I, I'm expecting him to say, where's the pizza? Like, what? And he looked at me, and he said, I came here because I need help. And I looked at him, what do, what do you mean you need help? He said, I need help. You see, back in April, his dad went to prison. His mom was an addict, and and he was a 17, 18-year-old boy who was tasked with the responsibility of not only taking care of himself, but taking care of his mom. He found a place for his mom to live at a friend's house, and he's sleeping on the couch of one of his friends and working two jobs and going to school. And what he had found began to take place in his life was that some of the same addictions and habits that he had seen his parents have began to creep into his life. And he looked at me and he said, I just need help. He said, I don't know how to stop doing the things that I'm doing. And I looked at him and I said, you're in the right place. You're in the right place. Because it's not about what you stop doing sometimes. It's about what you start doing. And that night, this 17-year-old boy came to a church that was closed and sat in a near-empty auditorium just like this and raised his hand all by himself to say yes to Jesus for the first time in his life. He said yes to something. He started something new in his life. We don't have the luxury of just saying no, of just stopping. We have to find some things in our life that God calls us to start. Are you with me, Sam? I'm with you. I'm going to share a verse with you out of um, 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19 tells the story of a man named Elijah. At the time, Israel had one of the worst kings they had ever had. A king who just killed the prophets of the Lord. His wife was worse than him. And things just were not looking good for the prophets of the Lord, for the people of Israel. And so we read about this king, and and you may recall the story. Elijah goes, and and he challenges the prophets of Baal, and they go before, and they set out a sacrifice, a bull out on the altar, and 
the, the prophets of Baal begin to call on their gods. And they say, gods, come and, and, and consume this sacrifice with fire. And they call out all day. It gets so intense, they begin cutting themselves, doing all kinds of ritualistic, cultish-type activities that began to take place. And then Elijah steps up. And he says, in the name of the Lord my God. And the fire consumes a sacrifice that had, had water poured on it. And in that moment, God did an incredible miracle right before their eyes. And right after that, Elijah gets some bad news that King Ahab's wife, his, her name was Jezebel, had something to say about that. So we read the story in chapter 19, verse 2. It says this, So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely. If by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of the prophets of Baal. Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, he sat down under it, and he prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life because I am no better than my ancestors. Here Elijah was. He had this incredible, supernatural, miraculous moment with the Lord before all these people. And in the very next chapter, two verses later, the king's wife threatens to take his life, and he finds himself sitting under a tree wishing that he would die. And I, I began to read this story, and I began to think about 2021 in our lives. If we're going to start something, we have to start positioning ourselves to persevere. It's not enough to have an incredible moment with God once. We have to keep it going. It's not enough to just experience it one time. We have to keep going back to the well that continues to fill our lives. So um, I don't like to run. I see Luke on Instagram all the time running. It just makes me feel bad about my life for about three seconds till I get to the next story. And, uh, but when I was in junior high, I got this brilliant idea. I don't know why, but in junior high, everybody ran track. Eighth grade was the first year and the last year that everybody could go out for track and nobody got cut. So uh, I, ran, I ran track in the, in the eighth grade. I loved the short shorts and the tall socks. Like that just, I don't know why they make you do that, but it's junior high. Junior high is just weird. So I remember getting it in my head thinking I was getting better and better. So one day my dad picked me up from track practice, and we're driving home, and I said, Dad, I bet I could beat you in a race. He says, bet. Now, at the time, my dad was about 40 years old. He was about 220 pounds. Like I, I'm thinking the cat is in the bag on this one. And so we get to the house, and we get out, and he says, all right, let's race right now. I said, okay. I said, let's go to the end of the street. And he looks at me, and he says, no, let's go all the way around the block, all the way around the neighborhood. I said, okay, do you want to lose that bad? And we took off running. Now, we take off running. Now, here's the thing. I had been training to run short distances, and I was a fool, okay? I had no idea what I was doing. And so I began to take off running, and I was going fast, and apparently my dad never read me the story of the tortoise and the hare, and I took off with everything that I had, and about halfway, I am, my, you know how when you run, your lungs just like, ugh, it's like needles are just stabbing them, I can't breathe, and I'm running, and my dad just keeps on going all the way, and that's the day I learned not to bet my dad anything. You see, he had a perseverance about him that I didn't know about. At face value, he didn't look fast, but he had an ability to run the race in such a way so as to finish. In our lives, we have to figure out how to position ourselves to be a people who have the ability not just to see God work once in our life, but again and again and again. We have to position ourselves to persevere. You see, Elijah had positioned himself to run. Elijah had a habit of running everywhere that he went. But he wasn't positioned to persevere, which is why the Bible actually talks about this, that Elijah, uh, the, the fire had come down on the sacrifice, and, and God had just shown off, and all this was going on, and Elijah looks at the king. There had been a, a drought in the land. There was a famine, and Elijah looks at the king, and he says, the rain is finally coming after all these years. And he tells the king, you better, you better get your chariot ready and head back home before the rain and the winds hit. And at that very moment, Elijah takes off running. 
And the Bible says that the power of the Lord came upon Elijah, so much so that he ran the entire 25 miles. The Bible says that he took his, uh, his tunic, his cloak, and he tucked it in his belt. All right? They didn't have Nike shorts. like They didn't have tall socks. He took his literal like dress, tucked it in his belt, and took off running in the power of the Lord. There was a supernatural in enablement over Elijah's life, so much so that in the rain and in the wind, he beat King Ahab all the way back. He, built, he beat the king who had the fastest horse and chariot of anybody else. He beat him back. Why? Because he was running in the power of the Lord. Can I tell you what happens when we don't persevere? We stop running in the power of the Lord in our life, and we start running in the power of fear. Elijah found himself in this situation caving to fear. So much so that he's sitting underneath a tree asking the Lord to take his life. Why? Because he lacked a muscle inside of him to persevere. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the writer says this. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? So he challenges you and he challenges me. He says, run in such a way as to get the prize. You know, sometimes I think we, that, we think that means run as fast as you can. But we forget that maybe what he's talking about is run in such a way. Persevere in your life in 2021 with the strength about you that you actually make it to the end. I don't know about you, but New Year's Eve, uh, my wife and I go to bed uh, at about 9 o'clock. Uh, for the last nine years of our marriage. That's how we have spent our New Year's Eve. Not my neighbors, though. Um, our neighbors spend a ton of money on fireworks. And I, I'm used to it. You know, every year you go to bed on New Year's Eve knowing they're about to shoot some fireworks off. And the only thing was, I don't know if you noticed, but this year they started about like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I woke up about 2 in the morning. They were still shooting fireworks off. And I'm thinking in my, in my head, I'm like, are we celebrating a new year, 2021, or are we celebrating the end of an old year? They just kept going, and they just kept going, and they kept going. But here's the thing. We all woke up on Saturday morning, and nothing, no matter how much you spent on fireworks, changed. You see, when we woke up on January 1st, the reality was this. COVID still exists. No matter what side of the political spectrum you fall on, our government and the challenges our nation are facing were still there. When you return to work on Monday morning and that person that you just can't get along with was still there. You see, what we realize in life is this, that sometimes we think if we can just get away from it all, and the Lord says, I'm trying to teach you something. He says, it's not just about stopping, it's about starting, getting yourself in a position to keep on going in the midst of the challenges. In 2008, there was a hurricane, Hurricane Ike. There was a, there was a community of about 200 homes. And I think, you know, I don't know if viral was a word in 2008, but uh, if it was, in 2008, there was a picture that went viral after Hurricane Ike. And it looks just like this. 200 homes in this community. 199 of them came down. And when you look at this picture, you're either mesmerized by one of two things. The complete destruction everywhere else. Or maybe you're like me and you wonder, what in the world did that guy do to his house? One house stands and 199 fall. And as we begin to look at our lives and take inventory of what God might do this year, we have to ask ourselves, how do we be that guy? How do, we, how do we be the one who has the strength inside of him to persevere in such a way that when nothing else and no one else stands, we do? How do we find ourselves so close to the Lord, so strengthened by the Lord, running in the power of the Lord in such a way that when everything else is falling apart around you, you have the ability to stand. You see, Elijah had to make a choice and make a decision. Am I going to run in the power of the Lord, or am I going to run in the power of fear in my life? You see, when we take an inventory as we head into this year, we take an inventory of the things that God may be up to in our lives, we have to begin to ask ourselves the question, are the power of my emotions driving me? Are the power of my circumstances propelling me along? 
Am I caught up by the winds of life? You see, here's the, the miraculous part about what Elijah did. Elijah took off running ahead of the king in the middle of the rain and the winds. They were fierce and they were violent. It wasn't a great day for running. I'm not going to run on a sunny day, much less on a day like today. See, but Elijah made this decision. I'm going to run in the power of the Lord, not in the power of the things that are going on around me. Can I challenge you? This is a word for some of us. You know, in 2020, we, we learned something. We learned that we have to find the strength from the Lord to stand even when no one else does. In 10 days into 2021, we've learned another lesson. That if you don't keep standing, if you don't keep going, if you don't keep running, you see, you know, in our lives we have to take a look. In my family, are there some things that I've stopped doing that were actually the things that the Lord intended to help my family get stronger? We take a look at our time with the Lord in the morning, and he says, you got to keep reading. you got to keep praying. you got to keep coming to church. you got to keep doing these things. Somebody say, run, Forrest, run. we got to keep after it. And Elijah had to make the decision to position himself to persevere in his life the same way that you and I do. The second decision Elijah had to make was he had to start positioning himself in the presence of of God. I think it's so interesting what happens in the passages right after this. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9, it says this, and the word of the Lord came to Elijah. He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites, they have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars, and they've put your prophets to death with the sword. And Elijah says something that isn't true. He says, I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. I love that line. The Lord is about to pass by. The second thing we have to do is position ourselves in the presence of the Lord. You know what, what uh, Elijah did? He went 200 miles it took him 40 days and 40 nights from the lowest point sitting underneath a tree wishing he was going to die. He got up and he went 200 miles and he stood on a, on a mountain called Mount Horeb, which also has the name Mount Sinai, which if you've read in the Old Testament, you've heard it before because a man named Moses stood on the mountain and heard a word from the Lord. You see, what Elijah was doing was he was placing himself in the presence of of God. When things aren't working out for you, the only place to run is to the presence of God. When things aren't falling into place, we need to make the decision, no matter what's going on around me, I'm going to put myself in the presence of God. And for 40 days and 40 nights, and what I imagine to be a weak state for Elijah, mentally, physically. The Bible even says he didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. He ate before he left and he went in the strength of the Lord. But I can imagine the conversations playing out in his head. Some of the same conversations maybe some of you have had in this very room, maybe as, as soon as even just yesterday. Some conversations that say, man, I'm not going to make it. Man, man, God was good to me then, but I don't know about now. Man, there was some stuff that happened to me last year. If you only knew that I lost my job, I lost my family, things were not working for me. And Elijah's playing out these conversations as he goes to the presence of the Lord. You know what I love? Is that even in the midst of all that happening in his life, he still knew that he had one thing that was going to help him. And that was get to the presence of the Lord. Kind of like the teenage boy who had never been to church except for when he went to a church camp at nine years old, made the decision to show up at the church doors because he had nowhere else to go. The church was closed, but God wasn't done working. That's true for him. It's true for Elijah in the Bible. It's true for you. Elijah made it a priority to get in the presence of the Lord. Because in the presence of the Lord, let me tell you something that begins to happen. Our perspective begins to shift. It's only in the presence of God that we can obtain the, the, the uh, perspective of God in our lives. So, so you've been asking some questions of the Lord. You've been struggling with some things. You have some questions that don't have answers. My challenge to you this year would be get in the presence 
of the Lord on a daily basis, every single day. You say, God, I'm going to pray. I'm going to worship. I'm going to read my word because I know in the moments of my life that I'm going to need it the most. It's going to come in handy that I spent time with you. When I was seven years old, my, this is Huntsville. When I was seven years old, I went out uh, to the country. My, uh, my, dad, my grandpa taught me how to drive when he was seven years old. When I was seven years old, not he. <laughs> that wouldn't have worked. Uh, when I was seven years old, I went and he taught me how to drive his old farm truck. And I loved going out there and spending time because I knew that I could drive whenever I wanted. And so I'd hop into his old farm truck. But um, before the days of Siri, uh, you know, there's this thing called a radio. Does anybody listen to the radio anymore? Does it exist? I don't, I don't know. But I haven't listened to it in several years. But uh, in his truck was not just a radio. This was an old truck. This was a radio that you turned the dial, right? Okay, all the older people in the room are like, you millennial acting like you're so old. And all the young people are like, what radio? So here's the thing. You'd reach out and you would turn the dial on this radio, right? And if you hit the station right on, you would hear it clearly. But if you didn't adjust the dial just right, all you would get is static, right? I want us to begin to look at being in the presence of God like adjusting the dial on the radio of our lives. You see, here's what begins to happen. When we spend time in the presence of God, what we're doing is we're reaching over to the radio. We're beginning to adjust the dial in our lives so that we can get our lives into a place where we have access to hear the voice of God speak to us. Elijah is standing on the mountain of God listening for the voice of of the Lord in his life. And he receives a word from the Lord. Why? Because he made a decision to do whatever it took to get in the presence of God. Some of you today are going through some things. And can I, can I challenge you? In a world where, where Google pretends to have all the answers, may we be a people who does whatever it takes to find ourselves in the presence of God so that we can hear his voice. When I uh, find times in my life where I'm not sure which way to turn or where to go, I'm often challenged to take an inventory of my habits, take an inventory of my disciplines. Have I been regularly getting up and spending time with the Lord? Have I regularly been attending church? And, and, and I know what it can sound like sometimes. It's like you're the pastor, you're supposed to say those things. But if it's true in my life, the, the times that I spend with the Lord have benefits that far outweigh the cost of the discipline. And if we could do that in our lives, what we'll begin to find is something very similar to Elijah. Elijah gets to a place where he hears from the voice of the Lord. And I'm not going to read the passage this morning, but here's what it says. Did you know that God didn't answer all of Elijah's complaints? Elijah sat before the Lord and complained and said, Elijah, or said, God, don't you know that I'm the only prophet left? He, he began to listen to the wrong voices. You see, because that actually wasn't true. The Bible goes on to say that 7,000 men had not ba bowed their knee to Baal, which meant Elijah was not alone. But when we start listening to the wrong voices, we get caught up in the lie of it all. Mark, uh, Matthew 4.4 4 says, a man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's one of my favorite verses. It says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so when you get in the presence of God, it, it paves a way for you to begin to hear his voice. And what can begin to happen is sometimes God doesn't answer all of our complaints. You know what he did? Elijah, I don't have an answer for the fact that you feel all alone. But you know what I do have? And in that moment, God gives Elijah a new assignment, a new purpose. You see, when we position ourselves to persevere and we position ourselves in the presence of God, here's what it does. It unlocks your ability to have a greater purpose in this year. Elijah went to the Lord. He didn't answer all of his complaints, but you know what he did? He said, Elijah, I want you to get up from here. And when you get up from here, I want you to go down there and I want you to anoint that guy to do that and that guy to do that and, and anoint the prophet Elijah who would come after you. And he begins to tell Elijah what his purpose is. And when Elijah finds his purpose, he begins to unlock something inside of him that he once remembered he used to have. 
I, uh, I'll never forget him in seminary. I, uh, or this was college back in about 2008. I went to a class, and one of my professors was beginning to tell us a story. He was a pastor, and he told us the story of a man who came into his office. In this season of his life, the man was at his low. And uh, a lot like Elijah, he was ready to end his life. And the pastor looked at him, and hopefully by the leading of the Holy Spirit and with a lot of gut, he looked at him. He said, hey, sir, I just want to let you know I don't have time today. Um, I have a lot of people who are sick in the hospital right now, and I have to go visit them. And he sat across the table from this guy, and he looked at him. He said, here's, here's what I need you to do for me. Uh, I need you to go to the hospital. And there's a man, he's in room 103, and I just need you to go down there. I need you to talk with him, ask to pray with him, and just sit with him while he is in his pain. And the man gets up from the pastor's desk, and he could have been offended, but he wasn't. You know what he did that day? He got up, he went to the hospital, and he sat with a man who was on his deathbed, and something clicked inside of him. All of a sudden, things began to start shift in his life, began to shift Things began to change. And the man who once sat across from a pastor asking uh, questions about his problems and the things that he was struggling with turned into a man who sat across from a pastor and said, God has a plan and a purpose for my life. I'm here for a reason. God did the same thing for Elijah, and he can do it for you. Your greatest purpose can be unlocked when you spend time in his presence and you make a commitment that no matter what's going on around you, you will persevere. When I was in high school, my uh, uh, friends and I were going to see a Christian speaker and worship band in downtown Kansas City at a theater called The Uptown. And we went downtown and we were late to the event and so uh, parking was scarce and the parking garage was full, the lots were full, and so we had to park in a dark alley on the, on the back end of the theater. I remember in high school we were late, we got up and we uh, closed the door and we locked the car and we took off running down a dark alley. I think I even remember making a joke about being in a dark alley trying to scare the girls. They took off running. And we walk and as we walk, we round a corner of the street and sitting there on the corner of the street was a man who appeared to be homeless. I remember that encounter so vividly inside of my mind. I saw him and I did something that I completely, fully regret. You know those moments where you feel awkward? You know those moments where you don't know what to do or don't know what to say? And I remember in that moment just bouncing my eyes, and I looked at my watch instead of looking at the man who was clearly turning to look at me. And I walked on in. I went on about my business, and I went inside, and 3,000 Christians are in there worshiping and giving their heart to the Lord and, and, and hearing a word from the Lord. And the whole night I sat in there, and all I could think and all I could hear God say to me was, did you miss something? Jesus was out there. And I remember sitting there and just thinking those thoughts. And to top it off, we got up that night. We walked out of the theater. And when we walked out of the theater, our entire street was blocked off with police sirens, ambulances, fire trucks, police crime scene tape. And right in the middle of it all was our car. Everyone else went to their parking lot. But we had to walk and be escorted with a police officer right down the side of the street. And as we walked by, the exact spot where that man once sat was a sweatshirt covered in blood. I remember going home that night thinking, oh my goodness. The next day I hopped on the news and, and I read the report and an unidentified man, a homeless man, was hit in a hit and run accident and passed away. At 18 years old, I remember sitting in my car thinking, Lord, I will never, I will never be found guilty of missing an opportunity to live the purpose you have for my life ever again. I will persevere. I'll spend time in your presence. I want to know what your voice sounds like so clearly so that I don't miss a thing. In your life, God has a purpose for you. He has a challenge for you this year. Good things in store for your life, but it's going to require something of you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? Everybody, thanks again for joining us. We believe God has something great for your life, and we hope this message encourages you to take the next step in your faith. Have a great week.